Hi, everyone. Welcome to this WESA's webinar. My name is Laura Villalobos, WESA's Community Manager, and I, I would like to welcome you to this webinar with Troy Stevens from Sandia on the topic of transformation of the enterprise computing from one-prem to cloud. But before we get started, I'd like to introduce you a little bit more about the WESA's organization. We often go, often go by our acronym WESA's, as in we sisters, because that's exactly what we are, a global sister Cyber Sisterhood. We are 501c3 with over 8.1 thousand members in 70 countries. WESIS is a premier organization with global reach dedicated to bring together women in cyber. Our mission is to recruit, retain, and advance women in cybersecurity. We have our all of our programs and initiatives are made possible by our supporting partners. We have our professional affiliates, student chapters, equity advocacy committee, mentor mentee program, speaker bureau, job four plus, and so much more. You can view our training programs initiatives on our website at wesas.org to learn more about the different ways to get involved beneath Wesas community. We all of our wonderful initiatives to our strategic partners or tier one partners being Alchemine, Amazon, AT&T, Cybersecurity, Battelle, Bloomberg, Carnegie Mellon University, Software Engineer Institute, Cisco, Ford, Fortinet, Google, Lockheed Martin, Microsoft, Optum, Sandio National Laboratories, and Sentinel One. As a reminder, we encourage all of you to ask questions throughout the webinar. You can put them in the chat in the presenter and we'll answer them at the end. We have the experts here with us today and they look forward to hearing from you. If you haven't so already, please subscribe to our WESA's newsletter at www.wesas.org. I also have it attached in the attachment section of the webinar so you can just click through the link and sign up through there. And um, with us today, we have Troy Stevens from Sandia National Labs. Um, on the topic of transformation, cloud and modern enterprise IT. So Troy, take it away. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so a uh, little bit of back, uh, I'll get into background about me, but it was great to see that two institutions that I belong to are on that top tier of, of sponsors. And so both Sandia National Labs and um, Carnegie Mellon. So. I'm a graduate of Carnegie Mellon University. I also go back to Carnegie Mellon um, about once or twice a year to do recruiting for Sandia from there. I've got a lot of great relationships with people. Um, so it's great to see that uh, two institutions that I belong to are, are sponsoring this great organization. So I uh, also have three sisters um, and they're great. And you know, women are amazing in my life. Uh, my, uh, my wife did a 14er with me just recently, a 14er for those that don't know is a 14,000 foot uh, Elevation Mountain in Colorado. We've been doing them together for about seven years, eight years, and we've done about 13 of them at this point. So she's a real big trooper and uh, it's, it's just awesome to be with her and to do those things. So I just wanna briefly talk about Sandia just real quick and then I'm gonna jump into uh, the talk. And so Sandia, we have a, a real important mission from global security um, to nuclear deterrence, uh, national security programs, and energy and homeland security. This is where I do a lot of my work. I do a lot of cybersecurity work, and then uh, also in advanced advanced science and technology. We do a lot of basic uh, science and technology. Uh, really cool things of what we've done over the years. And so, uh, just jumping into this, we we hire lots of uh, interns. I think last year we hired around eight nine hundred some interns, um, and it's great. And we have a lot of those that uh, that we put in pipelines and, and really help us uh, as we've grown. So when I started 22 years ago, we had about 8,000 people at Sandia. We now have about uh, 14 or so thousand at Sandia over that 22 years, a lot of growth, uh, just because there's a lot of challenging uh, things that our uh, nation is facing and a lot of important advancements in terms of so many areas in the science fields that, that need to be done. Uh, in fact, my wife also works uh, at Sandia National Labs. Uh, she's not STEM, she's on the business side, uh, but she does a great job there. She's a, she's a master's in accounting and uh, she's brilliant in what she does. So just at FYI, and you see Sandia there, we've got a site in Albuquerque, also one over in, uh, in Livermore, but there's a lot of other great labs that need amazing people working for them and, and doing great work. So I just wanted to put this out there too, that um, you know, I, I'm very in touch with a lot of the people that I work with across uh, the national lab spectrum and, and even within certain government agencies that I do a lot of work for. I'm currently on a special assignment in DC uh, and working with uh, CISA out there. So 
it's been really fun to to be a part of them and to get to know them a whole lot better and, and to get to know everybody there. So it's been a great journey. So and we, I think as earlier had mentioned some of the hiring opportunities. You know, we've got a lot of internships and full-time positions that we're looking to hire over the next couple of years. So a little bit about my background. I mentioned a few of these. So I've been uh, at Cyndia for a little over 22 years. I started as an app developer. Um, I loved the security of application development so much that it just was a natural fit for me to migrate more into the security side. So um, I, I felt like there was a real big um, miss, if you will, when there was a lot of people who were developing on internal applications that just assumed that they were safe. And uh, I saw this way too many times where people weren't checking inputs, they weren't checking the way the data was being transferred between uh, HTML forms, and that has changed a lot over the, the many years. And uh, it just really, really bothered me. And there was, uh, so I, I pushed for a lot more internal security and in how we do security, how we think about security. And what was really funny is, I don't know if many of you have ever heard of the principle of zero trust and how zero trust is becoming a real big uh, topic. And uh, CIS has even published on this and, and um, I've had some hand in helping to contribute to that. But uh, actually, I got to meet the founder of zero trust twice this last year and uh, had some meetings with him and discussions. And it was really funny because it was about the same time uh, that he and I, I was about two years later than he was or so, but we were having the same thoughts and the same issues about the way that we should treat security and, and data and uh, how it needs to, we need to rethink the way that it's done in cybersecurity. So it's been fun to, to talk with, with him and, and a number of the other people who are really pushing some of the zero trust initiatives forward. Um, and so uh, I'm also a very avid outdoors person. You see the image behind me is one I took when I was up at uh, uh, Chuchas Lakes in, or Trampas Lakes, sorry, in uh, in New Mexico. And so I am actually headed out to go um, backpacking in Alaska next week. I leave tomorrow. And so that'll be a lot of fun to be out there. So I do like to be very active. All right, so let me dive into this a little bit. So traditional versus that uh, cloud enterprise, the modern. Uh, so the old school was these physical servers, very little to no automation. It was just a mess. Uh, so many people were doing manual processes, a little bit of scripting, but not a lot. I mean, you might maybe had a, a few Linux or Windows sysadmins that wrote some scripts and, and were automating a few tasks, but it just wasn't uh, a lot that was there. Uh, it was really hard to track costs. Uh, usually it was like, okay, well, you bought the hardware and you have a license and it was, everything was just tracked by cost. But if you had services that were running on top of that infrastructure, so applications or such, it, it was difficult for them to determine, you know, ultimately like how much that that was really costing you to run those particular services. Uh, it was more about what it cost to run the infrastructure. And so uh, that has changed a lot. And then it was really complicated to build or replicate environments because it took all these physical servers and it was a, you know, again, it was a mess and you had these big server rooms and I actually lived part of my life in a server room. I'm sure that some of my hearing is gone because of being in a server room for as long as I was, but um, I'm glad to be out of those and I'm glad that so much that I'm doing is uh, now virtual. And then also with the uh, perimeter-based security model, I guess I was mentioning before, it was really bad that if we just considered that network boundary perimeter is like all the bad guys are on the outside, all the, and then we're just doing great work on the inside. And it was only the people who seemed to expose things to the outside that really had to worry about it, but that wasn't always the case. Uh, it really wasn't that difficult back then. Uh, still, depending on what you're looking at now, it, there's varying levels of difficulty to get into these networks. And so we now, for the most part, consider that all networks are compromised. Uh, and then what are you gonna do to, to protect? It's, it's a total different paradigm than where we were at years ago. So uh, now we see these virtualized infrastructures and services, and I'll talk to the, those into more detail, uh, decoupled architectures and these integration points through things like I mean, APIs. And, uh, and it's great to see that happening. Um, when I was coming out of college, uh, XML was starting to become a thing. And that really changed the way that we started to exchange data. It was great to see that happen. We see a lot more automation and scalability. It's great to see the way that, uh, and I'll get to probably a story or two about how that has 
kind of baffled some of the old school security mindsets thoughts and uh, also using this infrastructure's code to uh, be able to build environments really rapidly. It's so fun now to say, okay, I, I need an environment to work in and, and within minutes you can have an environment that is hardened um, and controlled in a, in a really good secure manner and be available for those to start working in. And again, now you got costs are trackable across a lot of different dimensions. So you really understand at a much better level what's going on inside the system. All right, so a couple little caveats I wanna throw in here and that in each of these sections, I, I could just talk for hours and nobody wants to hear that because it'll get real boring. So I'm gonna keep it a high level. Uh, so just at an overview, there may be a lot of acronyms or initialisms. And so I'm gonna to try to define each of those as they come up so that uh, you understand them a little bit better. If I happen to skip one, just please throw it into the questions. Like, what did that mean? Uh, I think I've tried to do my best to make sure that they are defined somewhere in there. But again, if I if I mess that up, please uh, ask. And then one other thing is if certain products or companies come up, um, I don't want them to see, to appear as I'm endorsing them. But if I don't mention a product, it doesn't mean it's not an endorsement. I just have a couple of um, things in there that I'll talk about. But again, it's not an endorsement or a knock on any products specifically. Uh, there's just a few areas where I either have some links or I have some examples. Um, so going to the next slide here. As I mentioned earlier, one of the big changes here is really infrastructure as code, which is uh, IAC, you'll hear that used a lot, and being able to rapidly provision and modify and tear down environments using code. Uh, it's just, it's really cool how we do this. And I'll get into a very specific example in just a second in one area that we're doing this in. Um, and it's become very, very helpful for new projects that get started to do R&D type projects in which they might just throw them away after you do a little bit of R&D or to create new you know, environments that you want to do testing so that you're imitating production. And uh, it, it's been very helpful. And inside of these um, environments that you can rapidly provision, you can uh, have a lot of controls that are the same from one environment to the other or exactly the same. Or you can inherit controls at one level, but then modify them at the, uh, the lower level to meet the needs of that lower level. So this inheritance model is really, really important. Uh, the other thing that we can do here is we can track changes. And this is known as drift. And so, especially in the cloud uh, world. So when you see drift happening, not a good thing. Um, so you, you really don't wanna do that. So you, we're capturing these as is versus designed and seeing what's changed, who changed it, how did it get changed? And there's a couple of stories, I'm not gonna name any cloud service providers, but I've done a lot of research in this area. It's actually quite difficult in some of the logging from some of the cloud service providers to know exactly who did something and we, we learned that you can capture some of the data in one type of log and another data in another type of log. But what was surprising to us is that there wasn't a timestamp match that was uniform across them. And so if you had changes, numerous changes made around the same time in one log and then some uh, in the other log and you're trying to match up who exactly was doing those and when, it was really difficult to do that. So we've actually brought this to the attention of some of the cloud service providers uh, one is much better, but not perfect, and the other one's still not fixed. So just an FYI, like there, there's some really interesting things when you get into these core levels of research on um, like what some of the problems are that we're trying to solve and, and uh, point out. So another one is declarative or imperative. So declarative just is states, I need this type of resource. It needs to have a, these kind of features. And declarative is, is the way that generally people like to do it. Imperative is much more specific. You're actually writing this script that builds the thing that happens. And in declarative, it's almost like, I don't care how exactly it gets implemented, but these are the requirements that I have for it to be implemented. Imperative is you're actually writing the script to do it. And so there's uh, a lot of push to, to be more declarative because it gives more leverage to the software tools that are building out the environment to pick what it believes is the best solution. Uh, occasionally, there's a couple of hiccups, but um, it, it's actually quite good. Uh, now, building on top, here's the example I was saying I was going to get to, and these are landing zones. And so pretty much every major cloud service provider at the IaaS or the IaaS is infrastructure as a service or at the 
uh, PaaS level, so platform as a service, has some sort of a landing zone feature that's included. Uh, and I'll, I'll have some couple diagrams right after here to hopefully cement this concept of a landing zone. But the idea behind these landing zones, in fact, I'm gonna jump to the next slide just real quick to show some of the chaos that you'll see. So in, in these, and I'll, then I'll flip back to the other slides. So what you'll see here is that in the cloud first initiative that the government had mentioned uh, that came out oh, well over a decade ago, what it happened was is you started getting agencies that were just going out and securing cloud as fast as they could. And in many cases, it was solving the problem that the on-prem environments couldn't get them resources stood up. Uh, they were having struggles with who's gonna be the system administrator and, and all kinds of things. So they just ran out, secured cloud, they had money, they, they got their cloud resources. The, the problem at the end of the day was who was actually monitoring any of these cloud resources. So they were being paid for, but who is monitoring them? So as you see, like I've got these units, these units can either be different agencies, they could be sub agencies, they could be um, organizations within an agency. And these are like real world examples. In fact, um, these are actually scaled back just to show how crazy this was as they went to go acquire all these different cloud service. So all these are different accounts in cloud service environments. And uh, it was just chaotic as they went out there so quickly and it had to get managed better. And so what we were looking at doing is the best way to do this is to try to come up with a, a way to monitor and manage these accounts, but still give people the autonomy for what they need to do inside of their accounts. And so the landing zone allows that to happen. So going back to this landing zone slide, it has this architectural implementation of an organization and it includes provisions for these shared services and a hierarchy for development life cycles and even R&D environments. So having these, uh, this structure was really good because if I had a certain division or subdivision and, and they needed certain rules to operate, we can create those like guardrails, security guardrails for that organization that may be slightly different than another organization. And, uh, and, and going back to that, oops, wrongly, going back to that previous slide that I was showing, you know, what happens in most of these is they're actually using their own IAM, so the identity and access management. And so there's not even a single sign on across here. So when, and they're all siloed when it comes to data, and there's just so many problems. So even as we were trying to transition to the modern, without it being done with really a good insight and a plan, then we really created a worse problem. It was almost like having, you know, multiplying all these on-prem entities and we couldn't really talk to each other and caused just a, a whole load of problems. So with the landing zone, now we can have a bunch of accounts that are under kind of a, a master organization uh, environment, and we can create accounts within that really, really fast. And accounts is actually uh, an AWS term. In Microsoft, uh, you would end up having a management group that then would have these subscriptions. And so the one challenge in talking about landing zones is that a lot of the different cloud service writers refer to them as different uh, terminology. So in GWS, you would end up having you know, projects. And uh, so it's, it's just really interesting uh, to try to find some terminology that is unique across all these landing zones that doesn't either favor uh, a particular CSP or uh, you know, that is understood by you know, across all the, the cloud service providers. So, this is where there could be some improvements, but you know, hopefully that'll be, you know, it'll happen at some point, but they're really all over the board when it comes to terminology. And anybody who's worked with languages in the past know that when uh, that language is a really important thing to have norms in order to understand. So it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. So this is built using IAC and then inside these landing zones, you can have a lot of centralization of log collection, monitoring, uh, identity and access management, and even more things that I'll, I'll get talking about in a little bit. So it's really, it's great to have this hierarchy now that we can have where instead of having this chaotic part on the left, now on the right side, if you see, and I'm colorblind, so if I get these colors wrong, I apologize. If you look on that left side under the future, under either AWS, or Azure, or GCP, the blue dots are each of those um, projects that people might end up doing or accounts that they may have, um, or in Microsoft World of Subscription, and it's where you can do your autonomous work. 
those little gray dots that are to the side are these core like enterprise or shared services that are now available to all of those blue dots. And so now you only have to have a single Git repository and then you can build your pipelines off of that. And you can only, you have a single identity and access management, a single uh, monitoring and logging capability and, and SOC, which is the, the security operations center. So it becomes much better. In fact, what's interesting is while you see these gray uh, dots that are you know, on the left side of that cloud image, they actually can be shared within those CSPs or inherited within those CSPs. So they don't have to actually be built within there where those blue dots are actually very unique to the CSP. So it becomes really cool to see how this modernization happens. And when you can see the chaos of what's on the left and the organization on the right, uh, it's a much better environment to be in. So here's kind of a sample landing zone that um, that I put together and there's different ways of doing this. So on the, the left hand side, you'll see that there's these enterprise services that are there and looking at from security to DevSecOps and I'll get into more DevSecOps soon, network and data. And then on the, the right hand side, you'll see where we have these programs and missions or uh, business areas. And then we have prod and test and dev and a sandbox and very decommissioned. And inside of those, we can have the functional areas um, that we want to operate within. Um, so you can, those can be just different business units that you might want to have, or just operational areas. And then they can have the projects that are, are, are underneath. So ultimately at this level, you can have certain security controls that are more loose on development, giving developers a little bit more latitude in those environments. But as you get to production, it's much more locked down. And, uh, and even within the functional areas, you can have certain security controls applied to that functional area and different than one of the other functional areas or a sub-functional area. So you can do some inheritance there too. In fact, one of the, the things that we've been pushing for, we have in some of our environments is that uh, in the dev environment, you can have humans there. And in the test environment, you, you can also have humans who log into that environment. At the production environment, no human beings from a system administrator are allowed to be in that environment at all. And so if you see that there's a human system admin in there that can set off alarms, and now you know that there's a problem because uh, we shouldn't see human um, beings going in there or have that limited down. So, um, so that's a, a, just an example of the landing zone. Some people, they like to turn that around. So they have the functional areas first and then within their functional areas or sub-functional areas, they have the prod, test, and dev. I mean, there's, there's different ways to do it. I'm not saying that this is the right way, um, but there's a number of ways to do that. Um, next is the DevSecOps. Hopefully you guys have heard of this uh, paradigm. This was one from Carnegie Mellon. There's one that we had created, but I was really having a problem with the colors to get it to show. But the idea behind DevSecOps is ultimately it's a new paradigm which you have both your dev team, your security team, and your operations teams that are working together to develop and release, to monitor, get feedback from all of the different aspects of an application that is released. And nowadays, a lot of applications aren't released in a very monolithic way. We've started to um, essentially use microservices to manage them. And so they're released in containers or sub-modules. And so you can release and deploy these sub-components of applications at any given time. And, you know, so some companies, they release, um, you know, multiple times a week or multiple times even a day. Uh, it, it's a really cool way of in, incorporating your security with your DevOps that you have. And uh, one of the things that we will take advantage of, especially with the people that we work with, are uh, bloom green deployment models in which uh, inside the blue-green deployment, we'll just kind of swap uh, components out quickly. Uh, the idea really is that we never patch in production. So we actually replace um, with a, a new environment. And uh, it it's really kind of interesting because we've seen through the years a lot of, of issues that come up with patching in production. You, you know, some companies will eliminate, you know, they'll, they'll, sorry, I shouldn't say eliminate, but they'll have downtime. Um, certain hours of the week, on certain days of the week that they can do these updates. But um, we have been able to get this to set up where you just replace in production. You don't patch anything. Uh, you just replace it with whatever's new, whatever, whether it's infrastructure or whether it's the application, you just replace with what's new. It's, it's kind of a fun way or a new way of, of 
you know, considering this going into the, into the future. It does create a lot of um, issues when you're tracking artifacts, uh, especially if you're replacing things rather frequently. Um, but I'll, I'll give an example of one that I thought was a great story that where we had modernized an application for one of our partners. And uh, what we were doing is every week we'd go out and we'd grab the latest modules in addition to the code that we had. And so it would do this weekly build and then it would deploy the build. It would, it would do a number of security checks and other things. And then it would deploy the build um, to its operational center. So then the operational center would see, okay, I, knew, I have a new thing that's out there. That, that's the new production tag that's on it. And so next time it built a container, it would grab this image and uh, then we were good to go. And all the old ones would then die off. So when the log4j issue came out, um, we were able to just automatically pull the latest updates that were coming from the, the various vendors that provided certain modules of the code. And what had happened on Monday, they were asking us, how are you guys exposed? And what is your plan to have it patched? And so there was a lot of teams on different projects who were trying to figure out just how exposed they were. And when we got online Monday, we said, well, we're already patched uh, because it picked up the patches on Sunday on our nightly run and it got deployed and everything's out there, so we're good. And they were just shocked that um, we actually had an answer on Monday as to where we were in terms of the patching process. And, and everybody else uh, through the week was scrambling just to see where they were even exposed. And so we had a much better answer to uh, to this problem. And so it was it was really fun to see how the people who did the old school versus those that were doing it new school just had a much better uh, environment. It's not a perfect environment. I'm mean, getting into some of the issues that may be there um, at some later depth. So on the logging and monitoring, I talked about this earlier because this is important. When when people just went to cloud first and it got crazy and all these clouds, nobody was really monitoring logs. So how do you know you were secure? Uh, when we got into this landing zone environment, it was great because now we have a centralized location that we can bring all these logs into. And uh, we had teams that were dedicated to monitor these logs. So we can see not only how uh, each individual either account or subscription was being affected, but we could also get this bigger picture of what was out there with inside of that landing zone. Now the problem to these landing zones, and even if you get into SaaS, so the software as a service, is that um, trying to figure out between the landing zones, that holistic picture. So within the landing zone and all the accounts within it, it was fine. Uh, there's some additional challenges to try to see across these, these landing zones, multiple landing zones. Uh, and then also when we have all these SaaS providers that are out there that so many companies have moved to, a lot of them for HR services, like payroll and uh, you know other various HR uh, ERP systems, and uh, you know just travel and and all kinds of stuff, or even some document management. A lot, in fact, one of the, the most two most popular ones are uh, Outlook. You know, people use or the, I should say Office, the M three sixty five suite, and then Google's uh, Workspace suite, so GWS. Uh, those are two very big ones, and so. In that case, it started monitoring all of those logs becomes very difficult because now you have logs that are sitting on all these other uh, systems. And you know, do you just monitor within that environment? Do you try to backhaul all the logs and then do the analysis there? There's a lot of challenges here and there's some pros and cons to doing it in different ways. Um, so, but I'll, uh, again, I could pontificate on that for a long time, but I only have about another 15 minutes before I start wanting to answer all the questions. And I appreciate those who have submitted questions so far, and I will definitely get to those. Uh, so the next part is identity and access management. And this is a hard thing to do. And it's a hard thing to do right, because it's really a major attack vector that uh, adversaries use. And the way that this is being done is changing a lot. So. Uh, we now finally see more and more companies using MFA. They're not all phishing resistant. So if you're getting it coming into your phone um, through like text messages, that is not phishing resistant. If you're getting it through applications, then that becomes more phishing resistant. If you end up using things like YubiKeys or PIV cards, uh, that is phishing resistant for sure. So we are trying to push more 
companies and entities to try to use phishing resistant MFA uh, options, but also not make MFA a pain. Because when MFA becomes a pain, uh, people either will avoid using applications or doing certain things, and that's not what you want to do. So that really is that second bullet. We were trying to use SSO to reduce the, some operational friction. So you know, once you get a chance to log in, then we use the single sign-on, which is SSO, uh, to be able to get to multiple applications uh, by passing those tokens, those authentication tokens, and making it easier for everybody uh, so you don't have to keep authenticating to multiple environments. And then uh, one other thing that I think is really interesting, you have some people who are hesitant to go to the cloud because they start to say, well, if something goes bad in the cloud, and I do think that at some point something will. Uh, there's been a few incidents where cloud providers have gone down for certain periods of time, and, and that's unfortunate. But you know, I think that there, there could be a time where you, there's a major cloud breach bigger than what we've ever seen. I don't know when, I don't know who, um, I don't even want to guess, but I, I just think that it may happen. And so people will say, at that point, um, I'm going to be glad that I kept everything on-prem, right? I, I didn't move into the cloud. But what's happening on the IAM front is that all new IAM is actually being designed as a cloud-first um, way of doing things. So, so one of the major IAM providers for many years, uh, a number that they gave me, an approximate number, was uh, just to show some scale. I wouldn't worry so much about the numbers, but just the scale of it in terms of the percentage before, you know, the who is working on what. They said that if they had about 1,500 people working on their identity solution, that a few years ago, 1,200 of those would have been working on the on-prem and about 300 would have been working towards uh, building out the new solution for the cloud. Now, they say it's about 1,200 working on the new solution, rather the cloud solution, and 300 that are providing only security and patching and maintenance, like the bare bones maintenance of their on-prem solutions. So even for those who, people who may say, hey, the cloud may be risky, I might not want to go that route. At some point, your identity is likely going to be sitting on the cloud regardless. So it's, it is a thing to be thinking about um, that people should be aware of, of where this is really uh, going to end up. The one other thing I want to mention that's really cool that has changed a lot was as an application developer, we always had certain secrets or keys, passwords that we had to have uh, that were in our applications or that we had to set up with inside of the servers. And what's cool now is that we can actually do this where the developers actually never get to see the passwords. They don't know. Um, and it's great. And there's ways that we can do the secret management um, in which Developers just need to know what environment they're deploying to. The environments have the ability to get to the secrets, but the developers themselves don't know how to get to those secrets. And what's good with that is then those secrets never get stored in Git. Because if you've ever done like searches in Git, there are a number of, <laughs> of articles you can find where people just do open source searches on Gits for secrets and, and passwords and keys. Uh, it's amazing at how much you know, you actually find in these environments. So, uh, and, and it's a really, it's kind of an interesting thing that people have done to define to those and the results are kind of astounding, but they're getting better, which is really good. A um, couple of other things that are really important, the SIEM or SIM, uh, I've heard them used interchangeably. SIM probably more recently, and, and which is just the security event and incident management. So just a data repo where you use um, analytic tools to monitor, detect an alarm, alert, uh, be able to track incidents. And then these can be very, very, very expensive, um, especially as you bring in a lot of data. Usually, they're, uh, they're co they cost more about the amount of data that you bring in, and cloud environments make a lot of data. Um, and so it, it, it's really, uh, but it's a good tool. Like there's a lot of cool things that you can get out of them. And then the other one is uh, security orchestration automation. And this is actually something where in the cloud environment, uh, there's a little bit more ability. And by cloud environment, really, that, that it's built on code. So because you have these code-based environments, even down to the infrastructure, it becomes easier to take an automated response that comes out of the SIM and then be do some kind of orchestration in your environment to make a change to either remediate, cover, mitigate, uh, you know, some kind of, of actions. And so, you know, some of the things that we've seen in here are just moving, you know, certain entities into a say like a deception, a deception technology that we can now monitor what um, 
somebody who is deemed to be a bad actor and we can start to see you know what they are doing uh we can also uh instantaneously change some of the rules that you might have on you know firewalls or um some of the sensors that are looking at the data coming across the wire so there's there's a number of things that can be modified in fact sometimes you can either block accounts or you can force um, another authentication. So it's like, all right, well, we know that you've already authenticated, but something doesn't look right. So we're gonna force you now to authenticate again if you wanna keep your session active. So it's kind of interesting to see that happen uh, now that we are able to automate. This is, uh, the data side is probably one of my big loves. Um, it's changed a lot. We now hear so much more about uh, data lakes and um, just the evolution. You know, when I was younger, you know, it was all SQL databases and warehousing, and now we're not going that route as much anymore. There's so much more NoSQL and uh, the data lakes that are just really fun to work in that uh, have a challenge. Now, that said, there are certainly opportunities or areas where SQL is the right solution for the job. And then there are some where no SQL and getting into data lakes is the right tool for the job. And so one of the, the mantras that we go by is we wanna get the right data into the right format and the right data store with the right tools to do the right analysis. And so we follow this as a mantra for everything we do because we know that there's flexibility in the fact that different units within inside of uh, the agencies that we're working in need to look at data differently, analyze it differently. One of the other big uh, changes that we're making is really going to the data democratization. So not, you know, in the past, so many people, they brought in data, they just felt like the data they owned, it was theirs, they controlled it. And what we really want to do is change that philosophy to the data that's coming in for that organization really belongs to more people at that organization than just those that bring it in or, or, the, or run the program or whatever it may be. So we're trying to change that paradigm uh, greatly. And that's leading to a lot of really cool analytics that have never been done in the past and uh, and helping a, a lot in that area. And uh, as a part of this, uh, some people may have heard of ETL versus ELT, which is just extract, transform, load. So we're getting rid of that ETL paradigm, moving more to the ELT paradigm, which is transform is one of the last things that we're going to end up doing. So we're gonna extract, which is, we're gonna just get data, we're gonna load it into the area that we need, and then we're gonna put it into that, either that format or the, or the data store that's necessary. And, and we've seen this a lot because you may have some um, entity that really wants data in a uh, parquet type wide column or format, or you might see some entity that needs it into a graph database. And those are two very, very distinct ways of dealing with data, but, uh, they really have those needs and it's really cool because years ago it had taken a lot of effort to try to get these to work correctly uh and nowadays with uh, the modernization of the environments you know we can actually have it as a part of the data pipelines built on code and they could be orchestrated in engineers to do this um, and then the, one of the last ones and i'm almost wrapped up here is just the collaboration tools uh, this is happening a lot where uh, these environments are, the way the communication happens is way different. Um, I, I'm going to just be blunt and say people who are generally older than me use email. People who are younger than me use IM type of devices. So uh, I, in some of the environments I work in, that's like Slack and others, it's like Mattermost. Um, and it's, you can almost see like a generational divide in who uses what tools. I, based upon the people the, the core number of people in my project that tells me like which uh, communication device that I'll end up using for either team. I've got a couple of teams of, of really young, you know, recently out of college. We rarely communicate on email. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating to me. And I've got, you know, other ones where it's older, I don't know, older is the right term, but just They've been around a lot longer and then they're all, all communications email. So it's really interesting to see how these collaboration tools have changed over time and who uses what. Uh, and so the, it's kind of fun to see that evolution. One last thing I just want to talk about here is uh, ATO and ATU. Some of you may never encounter this and some of you may encounter this, but ATO is just the authority to operate. ATU is authority to use. And there's another one in here called ATP. I don't show it here. That's just the authority to proceed, which means you don't have a full authorization. 
Um, you just have you know to to be completely independent at that point. Um, but you have some provisional authority to be operating in the environment that you're in. One of the benefits of this landing zone concept really allows you to ATO the entire uh, landing zone itself. But then all those little projects or those accounts that were in there, they inherit all these controls. And if you're familiar with like the NIST 853 controls and also um, the FIPS 199 and 200 and how that determines what your NIST um, 853 controls will be that you have to, to implement or at least account for. Uh, you inherit all of those controls through the landing zone. And then uh, only things that are really unique to your either application or your environment that you have inside of your account or your subscription or your project uh, inside the landing zone, you have to then account for, and that's the ATU, the authority to use, not focus group tested. I'm not sure that's the best name that they could have come up with, but um, the nice thing is that you inherit so much of these controls. So it just makes it a whole lot easier at the end of the day to get these authorizations to, to actually do work um, and to, to operate a system, especially in, in government environments. I don't know how many commercial environments actually use ATOs, ATUs, but it does come out of NIST. Uh, and I know that there are a few that, that either follow the guidelines to, you know, as a way of a good example, in the government, usually it's a requirement uh, to at varying degrees. Most of them do consider it as a requirement, but uh, these have historically can take 18 to 24 months. But um, as we move to continuous ATO processes and with ATUs, that the idea of the ATUs would take weeks instead of months to years and uh, ATOs can be continuous. And so you never have to really ever stop a system or do a lot of arduous work at any given time to do the ATOs. So it, uh, this is all improving. It's becoming a whole lot better. All right. And if you haven't ever seen this, uh, I just wanted to mention this as the shared security responsibility model, the difference between SAS, PaaS, IaaS, and on-prem, and uh, just how this works. And so how, at the end of the day, there's a whole lot more that you're responsible for on prem and then versus IaaS, and then less that you're responsible for on PaaS, and even less on the SaaS environment. There's, I've heard people use a pizza analogy for this, where ultimately on an on prem, you're responsible for all of the pizza. Uh, and then as you move up, essentially SaaS just becomes you're just responsible for what toppings you want to put on it. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of an interesting way of looking at it. I kind of butchered that. My apologies there. So with that, I'm now wrapped up. And so I see there's a number of comments or questions that are there. I'll start getting to those. And uh, so let me go to the, the oldest ones first and then I'll capture it onto the new ones. All right, so let's see. So the, the first one from Jade, it says, for clarification, did you mention that the changes made to cloud logs by users are difficult to track? and an ongoing issue with some cloud service providers. So I wanna be really clear here that um, the there's a lot of great logging in cloud logs that you that are even more verbose than what you can find in on-prem. So, but there are some logs, especially when you're looking at tracking environments and changes to environments in which uh, there are multiple logs that track those changes. And it's there's some, issues with the file stamps or the timestamps aligning in specifically in regards to just changes made to the environment. In so many other areas that uh, that logging is done, they're really, really good. They're really complete logs. They're very great logs on the cloud side. And sometimes almost too verbose. Like they bring in a lot of data. You might wanna do some kind of downstream filtering so you don't have so much data. Um, but I just wanna point out that it, there are a few logs that exist out there that do track changes to environment that aren't fully complete in tracking who did the change. And so when you try to align that to other logs that might have that information, um, they don't align perfectly on the timestamps. And that was a real key, interesting finding that we had, had discovered. So hopefully that answers your question. By and large, the, the vast majority of those logs are, are really, really good but there are just a few in the predominantly in tracking changes to the environment that had some flaws. 
Uh, let's see. The next one from Keith here is my background is some of yours uh, with that on-premise mindset and perimeter security experience. Can you recommend a good book or course that covers using security in the cloud? I don't have a good recommendation. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mine has just come from the School of Hard Knocks uh, and a lot of research. I wish I had more. The problem is that so many things move so fast in cloud that uh, I don't know if books could keep up. Um, and so I, and unfortunately, I don't have like a good book uh, recommendation or a course. I, I do think that um, there are some great free courses that I know AWS, Google, and uh, Microsoft uh, have on their development environments that are just outstanding. They're free. Uh, it only costs you to do the certifications, but the courses themselves are free. And uh, I highly recommend that people take those courses that are offered through either AWS or and or Amazon or GWS or, or uh, GCP, I should say, Google uh, Cloud Platform, just because uh, you can learn a lot. And they, they have everything from security to development to system administration. Uh, they're broad range of topical areas in the cloud. So I highly recommend doing that. Uh, all right, so Aza. So what resources are available to get training? Oh, okay, so hopefully that answers that question also on the training that's out there. Uh, definitely please look into those cloud service providers and the training that they have, because again, they're to, by and large, they're free. Uh, and then at that point, um, it's just a matter of if you pay for getting the certification. All right, so from Jay, what are your thoughts on the recent Microsoft Cloud email compromise? <laughs> uh, yeah, that wasn't good. That was really bad because that was a token issue on the uh, on the uh, authentication that was not well done. And that, from some recent things I've saw that they discovered that through some um, unfortunate series of events where some secrets were dumped via um, some syslog or some some log files after a, a system crash. And so just too much data was uh, dumped into the system crash files. And that's uh, that's my understanding of, of where some of that um, discovery from the threat actor learned how to make this compromise. Uh, and so this is one of the big warning areas. You can't always protect against a zero day or against something that you don't know, which is all the more reason why having the logging and monitoring is so important. Uh, you can put a lot of protection, security protections in place, but that doesn't mean you can stop everything from happening because there are zero days out there. I mean, there are people who are actively looking for these vulnerabilities and finding them. Some of them are just disclosed uh, through vulnerability disclosure programs. In fact, CISA has got a great vulnerability disclosure program that's out there that you can disclose vulnerabilities to. Uh, in fact, I've got a nephew who's done uh, some great job on his own. Um, he was on the U.S. Cyber uh, Security Olympics team uh, last year. Uh, it was great. You know, he, he does a lot of, he loves vulnerability analysis. He finds these things and, uh, and he discloses them. So, you know, they have the white hat hacker, black hat hacker, uh, gray hat. It's just really important that, um, that entities allow for vulnerabilities to be disclosed because if somebody who's not uh, a black hat that's doing that, uh, they could be exploiting it. So. Uh, it's great that people like the Department of Justice and CISA now have vulnerability disclosure programs that are making things much better uh, for companies to know that they've got uh, vulnerability issues. Because it's even with all the protections you can put out there, there's going to be some zero day, some compromise, something somewhere, whether you control it in an application that you've made or whether it's on the infrastructure that you're on. So in this case, you actually had uh, on that Microsoft Cloud email compromise uh, if you had all kinds of email security protections in place, that wouldn't have stopped it. It was on the it was on the infrastructure, and so that was actually discovered by um, active log monitoring. That was one of the agencies was uh, just happened to be uh, monitoring and checking. So it's great to see that happen. Uh, so hopefully that helped answer your question. Let me just make sure that I feel like I've got that. So. Um, so let me know if that didn't answer your question. Happy to go into more detail there, Jake. So that's a great question. So Chantel, let's see. I know we're getting towards the end. My certificate has, I don't think that's a question for me. I'll jump up to Keith. You mentioned people using 
uh, text messaging for communication. Is that ever an issue from a documentation standpoint? Actually, so the text messaging is an issue in terms of there's a lot of companies uh, or government agencies that have retention policies. And so um, there are some entities that have had to stop their workers from using certain texting uh, or messaging platforms because they couldn't meet the retention policies that were associated with it. Or there may be some issues with how they do their encryption uh, or the encryption ciphers that are allowed or not allowed. And so they then can't use certain um, messaging. So what we've seen though is, is more moving away from like text messaging sources and into things where, you know, emails got great retention capabilities, but not everybody wants to use email. So that's why a lot of these IM tools like uh, Slack and Mattermost are being used because they have much better retention that can be done um, there versus with some of the, the text messaging. That said, there's still a number of people who text message, but um, they're not always supposed to because of those retention uh, or other uh, a couple of other issues. So hopefully that helps to answer that one. Uh, can you confirm if uh, SIM are the same? Yes. So SIEM and SEIM are the exact same. It is, uh, you can see it all over the web is kind of different, uh, you know, like people doing it one way or the other. I've heard it seem, I've heard it sim. Uh, I just, my brain just does an automatic like conversion of both to the same thing. But yeah, they are the exact same thing. And then also, where can I find more information about interns at Sandia? I have a research background and would love to know about. Oh, that's awesome. So um, the best place to find out about internships at Sandia or full-time employment opportunities at Sandia is the Sandia website. So everything gets posted there. It's at uh, www.sandia.gov uh, slash careers, or it can also be at careers.sandia.gov. So either one will get to it. And then um, all those internships are either posted or being posted. And then full-time positions come out throughout the year. You can actually create job agents so that uh, as new positions become available, uh, you can be automatically notified because I'm sure that nobody here wants to spend, you know, every three weeks or so just looking to see what's new on, you know, various companies' websites. So these job agents come really, uh, they come in handy greatly so that, as certain new positions might meet criteria that you've set. So whether it's like you wanna be remote and full-time in computer science or something like that, or you wanna be, uh, you know, internship at the you know, New Mexico site and you're interested in cybersecurity. And so whatever criteria that you set, you know, they can then inform you of a new position that was just created on the site or just posted to the site. And then uh, it doesn't apply you to it. It just informs you of it so that you don't have to spend any time on your own going back to the, the site. So just set it and forget it. And uh, it's really helpful there. Let's see. Uh, hopefully I've, I've answered all those questions. If I have anything that I haven't answered or any other questions that people have, I'm more than happy to answer them. And But I just want to say thank you to everybody who's uh, participated. In fact, I think the last slide here is on that website. So. Uh, but again, appreciate the great questions that, that people have had. So thank you so much. Thank you.